So Klaus, I don't know if you guys were there, but a few years ago when we started NOAA, <laughs> this was 2009, uh, said something which caught the media eyes. He said, the European ecosystem is fucked up. What he was meant to say is, there are not enough exits, there's not enough venture capital. Klaus, this was four years ago. What happened since? <clears throat> well, um, I think we have done a spectacular job the last years. As vocal as I was at that time, um, I think to be fair, the ecosystem at that point in time was old probably like four years and not like nine years because at the beginning in 99, 2000, I think we just tried to start a little bit, but we were immediately washed out. So like in 2009, we really were nowhere. I think since then, um, a lot of things have happened. Um, so we have identity centers, and there are a lot of um, <clears throat> efforts going on. Like in, in the UK, you have a lot of state uh, efforts going on. In Germany, Berlin has established as an identity center where people from all over the place in Eastern Europe also move there. So I think um, there has been a tremendous um, development since then. So when you look at your companies today, the ones in your portfolio, I mean, I haven't even introduced Klaus because the assumption is that you know him as one of the probably most high profile uh, European angel investor and um, also probably stepping up in terms of the equity sizes. But tell us, when you think about exiting an ecosystem, because I guess the frustration 2009 was that there are not enough exits and not enough large companies in Europe, they exit too early. Tell us about the exit markets. Uh, is Europe the right place to IPO? <clears throat> well, I think to answer this question, you have to put it a little bit broader. Um, in order to have a sound exit markets, yeah, so why is the U.S. so much better? Because it has a more developed uh, capital market. And um, we don't have that here. So if you think in terms of exiting, uh, a share in the U.S. is a currency, and uh, companies use it as a currency because you have high multiples with stable uh, share prices, so you can use it as a currency. But in, in Europe, it's more like a mean to securitize pro uh, property. So hardly anybody uses a share uh, to, to buy a company, so mm. that's why, so why it's very difficult to get higher prices and also the mentality is different. You don't grow by using your cap table. So all acquisitions have mainly been done by cash payments. So American companies are more aggressive in M&A? They are more aggressive and they can because they can pay higher prices because at the end if their stock is valued at very high EBITDA or revenue multiples and they pay a slightly lesser multiple for the acquisition, they still make an accretive m a deal. And this matrix is always out numbers any European cash offer. Okay. Um, when, you, when you look at I investing in internet, um, what I find always surprising is that you seem to have the right nose for the right thing. Tell us a little bit how you look at your investments how you find them and, and how you, you, ma you manage them? <clears throat> I, I think it's at looking back, so connecting the dots, uh, um, you always find a, a way how you do it. The, the truth is there's a lot of serendipity and there's a lot of luck. Uh, so the only thing that I try to do systematically is only do software and platform companies which mm -hmm. address mass market retail audiences. Um, because I think there, with the history of uh, being along with AOL and, and, and Freenet, so there, there, I thought at the beginning of my career I have a justification to, to take care of that space. Um, else, today I would look at <coughs> models where um, there is a proven business. So you always have three risks. You have a business risk, you have an execution risk, and uh, you have a financing risk. So I try to um, still look at <coughs> Uh, find a mixture between original models where I'm willing to take the business model risk um, and some uh, models where the business model risk has already been proven. But it has to be a path where globalization can happen without so much frictions. Uh, so like we did with the rollout plans with the shopping clubs and the couponing businesses. So where you get to a scale um, that you can attract larger ticket sizes for financing and, uh, larger and solve larger problems for potential acquirers. 
So on the one side, you do like copycat models, but selectively, and on the other side, you like to take risk. Tell us about the teams. I mean, you, you set up 40 companies internationally at very interesting geographies. How do you find management? What do you expect from them? And how do you guide them? <clears throat> so first I would like to answer this copycat thing uh, because it's often misunderstood. Uh, and I think the copycat history of Europe is you have to see it in a light that every entrepreneur has to do what the parameters allow him. Yeah, so in the abundance of getting, uh, having a very big heterogeneous markets and getting very high valuation and a lot of money in, so you can only do what you, 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 you have a slight chance of success. And that was in the past um, developing a model with little and capital efficient for a local market. Yeah? So that was the first step how we grew our ecosystem. I think now with um, six very successful entrepreneurs um, <coughs> having done the first one and getting into the second one, like Lars or Marco Burius, yeah, so you see that we outgrow of this kind of the development stage of, of the ecosystem. So the, all the second time entrepreneurs, which I'm very happy to back several of them, um, have a total different aspiration. So they have a more global approach. They um, have a immediately higher scale by setting up the companies. Mm -hmm. They have a better access to capital because they are known. Um, and it goes, everything goes very fast. So my assumption is that these kind of companies will come out at a significantly different level in terms of market cap that we have seen in the first wave of the internet. So would you always prefer a serial, a second time entrepreneur versus a new starter? No, always not. But it has some advantages, especially if you dare a little bit more. Um, they don't get that, ner that quick, that nervous. Yeah, and, um, and they are also willing to swing the fence because they, are, um, they don't bet everything on one horse. And I guess they also have great experience in fundraisings. Yeah, that makes it way easier. It makes it way easier. And they have a different um, credibility in the fundraising, meaning venture capital feel more comfortable giving larger sums and higher valuations. Okay, let's talk about what you are doing these days. I mean, I think with the private sales, couponing, international rollout, you created, we have done some number crunching, I guess over 500 million of proceeds, which I think is roughly a third of the uh, Groupon market cap these days. Enterprise value. Enterprise value. So you have done significant um, interesting exits and you completed and you're moving on to the next. What excites you? <coughs> well, I try to start with the structural thinking. And the structural thinking is that I think we have all the bigger, biggest leverage if we get the ecosystem right. So a decent proportion of my time goes into thinking what, what does the ecosystem need. Uh, and I think we have to work, most predominant thing, we all have to work to make the European investors believe in the asset class technical. Uh, so they all started out in 2000, 2001, they all were totally burned, so we have a very limited uh, desire to invest again. Uh, so but <coughs> if, you, if you really look at um, the way how efficient tech investing is, and especially if you look at going forward, you probably have decent inflation, and uh, which asset classes can can protect, yeah, so we basically only have technology or asset classes where some of these things where you have scarcity, like food or oil. Yeah, all the others uh, on the 10-year horizon are not able to do that. So, um, and secondly, there has been current, so we took the other estimate the way how much market cap has been created in Europe. So you, you showed that already in your, um, in your uh, uh, slides, but if you take the top five internet stocks worldwide, uh, so they created in 10 years as much as the DAX 30 in Europe. Or the European ones, we, used, we, we, we quickly made a summary. I think we have like created 70 billion of market cap in the internet the last 10 years. And in that period of time, all the DAX companies created 200 billion. So while you said you're comparing apples to pears, what I want to say is that everybody, every family office considers putting uh, having equity in the DAX 
nobody considers having equity in, in tech startups. So I think if we change that model a little bit, and if we fight a little bit for our industry as an as as industry with good performance, with super performance, we can get way more money into the ecosystem, and then we will have more IPOs here, and then we don't need to sell everything to the case. And I think this, to this conclusion, a lot of grants venture capital is came as well, because it's side, uh, finer, uh, being more and more active in Europe. Would you see the U.S. We see investments in Europe as an early lead that also U.S. strategics will be more active when it comes to the exit markets? Difficult to say. Well, I, I'm, I'm probably not super, not prepared to, to judge on that so much. I think uh, it has been a little bit the case. Uh, yeah, we see that there's hardly any chance that a U.S. company comes to do with the last itself. Always has to do by it, but if there is a correlation between VCs coming and strategic, I don't know. Uh, so the, the other topics I, I spent time on, basically is a little bit I tried to draw some learnings on, um, on, on dis disciplinary considerations. Uh, so what did I do wrong? What, um, well, how, how do you spend your time when you invest? Yeah? So don't do, so what I, it's always easy to get into another exciting investment, but it's not necessarily the most smart thing to do. Yeah? So how many do, what do you do and how many restrict yourself? And in terms of when you go into certain markets, where do you get the most knowledge for that? Do you go in big markets? Which risks do big markets have? So I saw the, um, I saw this, uh, incredible, well-executed approach of that in, in there, and um, I and, and Lee Fixer did it, and I think he did a spectacular job. So when he thought that it's a big economy, and he tried to address, to my interpretation, uh, how did he address business plan risk, execution risk, and financing risk? So he went there for several years, and the moment there was, he thought the market was ready, he had several companies in the economy space, uh, and then he looked which of them execute best. Uh, so he had a business model that he was comfortable with. So we had first had experience which execute best because he was best in them. And then those ones execute best. He gave them tons of money. So also uh, uh, making a game changer for the financing risk. So and, and now I think he has done a spectacular success in uh, winning an entire market. India. So that's considerations I keep on having to see how do I address certain sectors ideally. Yeah. How do the entrepreneurs feel about your VC also funding your biggest competitor? I'm not an entrepreneur. Uh, so as India as must even have a worse venture capital industry than Europe, it sounds like. No, it seems to it's not true. So there was a certain period of time when everybody went there. So you have the Excel, the Norvest, the Intels, um, the Nokia, so the Sequoia. So you have a lot of companies and VCs there that have decent funds. So I think they had a lack of entrepreneurs for some time and over capacity of funds. Okay. So what do you think? We saw private sales, we saw kind of um, the Airbnb, the, the interesting B2B acquisition model. We saw uh, the couponing models. What's the next hot thing apart from Pinterest? Okay, I don't know if Pinterest is a hot thing. Um, <clears throat> but the next thing, so I, the, the funny thing with the, the two models you mentioned is for me they started out completely differently than they finally and morphed it to. Uh, so I think the, the flash model was a great way to get capital, capital efficiently into this e-commerce space, but then suddenly you needed to have shorter delivery time, you needed to have a broader offering, and suddenly you found a lot of them found themselves in a situation that they had stock, and suddenly the capital light model morphed into a capital heavy model. Yeah? Sometimes also driven by behavior of competitors. Exactly the same happened with the mobile business. So at the beginning everybody saw great what a capital efficient model, but if somebody spends uh, big time and changes the rules of the game, then also this model more completely different. And I guess the private sales, the big surprise for the market was that at some stage you 
is to buy inventory to be competitive, and that's bloody expensive considering that we're talking about big turnovers. And for the coupon clones, I guess the marketing costs were also unexpectedly high in order to get the, the customers in. Well, but that's also here's interesting. I think we need to prepare us in a different way with money. Right? Because if you look at this flash model, the flash model, I think the way it, it takes is inventory light, um, then you get to inventory, you have like 30 percent margin, then you have your own inventory, you have a little higher margin, but you also have a little bit way higher um, so capital cost and capital need. <clears throat> so you build it up and you get scale, 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 scale. And then at the end, the ultimate goal sir, will be to swap all this into proprietary brands to then come from 30, 35 percent, 50, 60 percent margin. And all that way, either you have enough money to go all that way or you get, get lost all that way. All right. Let me ask you one last question. Um, you probably saw in the program that we have a lot of topics around disruption. And I know that you're sitting on the board, I believe on Planner, Spotify, so you put your bets into the right or into the camp for big questions, big opportunities out there. Talking about music, talking about payment, maybe even navigation, which is another system where I guess we're still waiting for the winner to, to, to come out. How do you put your money or your effort around one player. It's sometimes very early, especially mobile payment. There are so many different players. How are you selecting like, where you put your money? Is it gut feel? Is it analytics? You seem to be very analytical on the economic side. For us, it's very interesting to know what's going to happen in payments and music. And some of them are earlier than later. Music, I would say, the game is quite five months. Payment is early. Maybe you can give us your perspective on these big themes and how you address them. So I think one very decisive um, characteristic is the, the passion thing. Uh, so there are people that mostly have economical background. They want to be self-employed, so they come up with a business plan and they start a business. Uh, so, but this is totally a different story as if some guy with a technological background who is very vivid and he has this problem of his in daily life and he wants to solve that and he's dying to solve that and suddenly like he's a music fan or whatsoever, but in his core emotional field, uh, he has something that he wants to solve for himself, and since he has a technological background, he tries to solve this problem technologically based. Uh, so I think this is the ideal um, proposition for, for, for a very promising DNA that an entrepreneur has. So you look for passion, which reminds me, I met an Israel entrepreneur a few days ago, and there was an M&A discussion, and I think he had 50,000 customers, and he said, it's a bit early for me to sell. So I asked the question, when is the right moment? He said, yeah, I want to add a few more customers. So I said, what, 100,000? He said, no, 15 million. <laughs> so that, I think, is true entrepreneurship, not selling out early. So Klaus is looking for the companies who have a long mission. And that's the most difficult question. The selling is the difficult question. I was totally struck because normally there are some merits in recycling uh, because the longevity of, of the models is, is pretty short, if we're honest. Uh, um, but on the other hand, I spoke with an entrepreneur who, after selling the business in 2001, bought a decent amount of um, of Amazon shares, and I think out of 80, he made 250. Uh, so just sticking to it. Uh, so and if you look at it, on, if you make the right bets, you should stay in the long. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, thanks also for going. I think you have been pretty much happy you're here and you've been answering tough questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.